We will now begin in the Word of God. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me into the book of Samuel. First Samuel chapter number um, 5. Let's go to chapter 16. And uh, I really just have a thought this morning. So, uh, you know, I, I, I usually like to have a sermon prepared, an outline and everything ready. But this morning that's not the case. And uh, I just want to mind the Lord. And uh, this message is what God gave me last night in my study. And I'll do the best I can. Y'all pray for me. In 1 Samuel 16, the Bible says, And the Lord, when you get there, 1 Samuel chapter 16, Say Amen. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? He says, Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint him to be king, whom I named unto thee. We find next that uh, verse 4 says, Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peace, peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eli and said, Surely the Lord anointed is before him. I love this. And it came to pass when they were come, he says, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, <laughs> I like this, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning, God, that you would revelate our hearts and our minds of what you would have us to say and do this morning. I pray, Father, that uh, God, we, we, as we know that you do not see, Father, uh, God, as I can see, but Lord, you see deep down in the crevice of the heart, Lord, and you know uh, everything that we think, everything that we are, Lord, there's no secret that we can hide from you. There's nothing, God, we can't run away from you. Father, you're everywhere. You're all present, Lord. We thank you. We pray, God, that you would help us this morning. As the prayer's been prayed many times, one more time I come to you, and I ask you, God, to draw each and every one of us closer to you in our walk. And may if there be one here this morning lost, God, I pray they'd get saved before it is too late in heavenly. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. This is the thought that God had placed on my heart this morning. And, and, and as I studied this scripture last night, as, as God doesn't see as man sees, but God looks upon the heart. And I, I thought just real simple, I hope this morning, not to get too complex, but just the thought that let's get our heart right with God. We, we need to get our hearts right with God. And, and probably the most important thing that there is that we could do today is to make sure that our heart is right with God. And uh, that, that's easy to say, but it's harder to admit and harder to do. And, and I, in all of this, I, I want to look at, at, at the, the story, I want to look at the situation, and we'll quickly get into the message. But we find here that Saul was the king of, of, of this time. And King Saul had um, done wrong in the sight of God. He disobeyed God's commandments. And God set him up as the first king over Israel. God had done wonders with Saul, and Saul was in, in war his whole life, but, but he had been one to defeat army after army, and God had blessed him. And, and over time we find that God, that Saul had disobeyed God in the commandments of God. 
And it, it, it repented God that he ever made Saul king. So God took the kingship from Saul and said, I'm going to give it to another man. Who was that? We find in this, in, in this passage of Scripture that this is the process in which God is calling that man, that next one, to be the king of Israel. And in the process, he goes to the Samuel uh, there and, and has Samuel uh, go to the uh, house of Jesse and, and pick out of one of his sons a king for the nation of Israel to reign uh, after Saul. And when he gets there, what happens? He sees this, he sees this man, uh, or this, the oldest of the brothers, which would be Eli, and Samuel finds that there's seven of the sons of Jesse there, and he chooses looking at the appearance of one who is the oldest, who is the tallest, uh, who is probably the, the greatest looking of them all, and says, that's got to be God's man. Look at him. That's him. And that's when we get to our story, and the Bible says that uh, God, God said, that, that is not the one I have chose, uh, Samuel, because I don't look as, as man seeth on the outer appearance, but, but God looks upon the, the heart of a man. God sees the, the heart and the soul and knows what you're thinking. He knows what we're doing at this very hour. You can fool a man. You can fool the preacher. You can fool your, 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 your spouse, but you can't fool God. We can't hide from God, can we? He knows, and He knows, and He knows. And so, so uh, God had chosen someone else. And it wasn't the, the tallest, it wasn't the, the best, but it was one that had the heart of God. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And God chose David because of his heart. And, and I think it's important today that if we're going to be used by God, I, 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 God give me this, it's real simple. It's so simple. But, but I believe if we're going to be used by God in, in our service, in our Christian service, it's important that our heart is right with God. I think that's evident. If God's going to use you to the utmost for His kingdom, it's, it's vitally important that the child of God has his heart right with God. And, and that's what we want to get at this morning. I want you to see something here that blessed me tremendous as I, as I read this last night. And, and it says here in uh, verse number Eight, that Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And so here we go, all of these sons are coming before Samuel. One after one after one. And each one, they say, no, he's not it. All seven of them passed, and God didn't, di didn't choose not one of them. W what are we going to do? And we find that, that in this text, he said unto Jesse in verse number 11, Are here all the children present? Are they all here? And he says, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Samuel said unto Jesse, listen to this, send and fetch him. And when I read that, it just jumped off the page at me and blessed my soul last night. Why? Because, you know, he, he, he's, the dad, the father has, has presented all of his sons, all of the eldest, all of the oldest, all of the best that would be more, the most qualified for the job. He's presented them to Samuel. And they're standing there. And then he says, I don't understand this, but God didn't prove any of these. He don't want any of these. They're not it. Do you, do you have another son? Oh, yeah, I've got another son, but he's the youngest. He's out in the field. He's, he's, a, he's just a shepherd boy. He's, 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 not, he, he's, he's, he's not it. And Samuel said, go fetch him. Go fetch him. And it just so happened to be the very one that God wanted to use was David. And, and the, the youngest, the, the one that wasn't the, 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 the tallest, and probably I believe that Eli probably fit the, the, the description. You know that King Saul was, was taller than any man out of all the Jews. He was a head length taller. They, they would come up to his shoulder, the Bible says. They, 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 this man was taller than anyone in, in Israel. The, the first king was that tall. So I would say that, would you, would you say this, that the... Um, Samuel, as he was picking, he probably thought that they had to look like Saul. He probably thought they had to be a, a tall and, 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 and fit that kind of criteria. And we see that that wasn't the case. 
that God chose the youngest and God chose and, and, and the point of it all the point of it all is to understand that when your heart is right with God, when you can get your heart in a place that it is right with God, God will use you. It doesn't matter how, how tall, how big you are, how, what your bank account is like, or, or none of those things matter with God. Because, you see, God created all of that. God's in control of every bit of that. It means nothing to Him. If He needs to get you the finances to do what He's called you to do, He can do that. He's God. He's big enough. If, if He needs to get you the, the strength to, to, to slay the, this or, or, or go up against the giant, guess what happened in the next chapter? David goes up, and guess who's shaking? Saul, the, 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 the biggest man that's there, a head length over everybody, shaking, won't go up against the giant. But guess who goes up against that giant and kills him? David, the, the youngest, the one that they said, ah, he's not it. But God said, go fetch him. And in the very next chapter, we see David standing up said, hey, I, God delivered me from the bear, and God delivered me from out of the mouth of that lion. And if God delivered me from all of that, I know that God will deliver me from this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine. And God did so because David had trusted in God. He put his trust. That's why I love that song I sang. All my hope is in Jesus. Because, listen, at the end of the day, nothing else matters but that everything that I've got, every single thing that I've got, it's not in me, it's not in myself, but my hope and my confidence is in somebody that's bigger than I am. Thank God for it today. And His name is Jesus, and all my hope's in Him. And, and real quick, let's look at these things. I'm going to back up into chapter number 15. I want to look at uh, just a few things here in chapter 15. Pray that it will bless you. I pray that it will bring you closer to God in your walk with Him. Uh, the first thing I want to look at, I believe that God gave me this last night, that it isn't a, a, a religion, but rather it is a relationship with Jesus. See that it, it isn't a religion, but it is a relationship with Jesus. It's a personal walk with Him. It, it isn't about ceremony. It isn't about ritual. Let's go back and look in chapter number 15 what the King Saul did that put him in the place he was in. See, in, in chapter 15 we, we do want to understand that Saul was given a command of, of God to go and, and to wipe out the Amalekites and to kill every sheep, every animal, every person because of the great sin they have committed. And, and these people, they, they were um, terrorists. They, they, they remind me very much of uh, Al-Qaeda and you know, those people that flew into the World Trade Center. That's the kind of people these Amalekites were. They, they, they were awful terrorists. And, and they were destroying uh, good people and and hurting people. And God said, I want you to go and wipe everything they've got. I want you to take out their sheep. I want you to take out their, their everything. Don't spare one thing. And what happened? King Saul, listen to this, in chapter 15 says um, that when, when Saul pleads for forgiveness, this is telling us what he did wrong. He's, he's finally admitting, this is what I've done. Finally, after lying twice, he pleads to God and says, God, will you help me? And this is what he says. Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy works, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You hear that? Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of God, of the Lord. And the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. I want to tell you this morning, it's important that we get our heart right with God, because we find in this text that somebody didn't think that was important, and God rejected them, and they didn't fulfill the purpose that God had for their life. If we are going to fulfill the purpose and walk in the plan of God for our lives, it is vitally important that we get our heart right with God. I think that's evident. And, and, and we see that Samuel did not do that. Why? Because he feared the people right here. He was afraid of what the people would do to him. If he didn't listen to God, he was afraid of what might happen. And, and it is uh, under this I want to, to pull out the fact that it is a relationship with Jesus, not a religious performance. And, and we see in verse number 13, 
how that Saul comes uh, to Samuel after all of this is done. He said, Blessed be thou the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So he, he's trusting in his performance. How good of a job that he did. But let's back up just a couple verses. Let's look at what God said about Samuel. See, Samuel said, I just read to you, Samuel said, Blessed be thou the Lord. He, he, or Saul rather looked at Samuel, said, Blessed be thou the Lord, for I have done the performance well. And, and now we're going to look back and see what, what, what uh, God said about that. In verse number and they came, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel. <laughs> it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, the and he cried to the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came. And that is when he meets he meets this man, this king Saul, and Saul says, I've done what God's told me to do. What is that? That's the outer performance, isn't it? That's the outer part of man. Look, look you know what couldn't happen? Saul uh, knew that, that Samuel couldn't see his heart. You know this morning that I cannot see your heart. There's no way that I can look and know what you're going through, what you've done. I would have no idea with any one of you. I have a hard time keeping up with myself. <laughs> That's the truth. But what he didn't know is that God had already told him what his heart condition was like. And as he gets there, he, he lies. I, I want you to know that he lied. And, and you know how many people would lie and lie and lie until they make themselves believe what they're saying is true? I, I've got family that, that, that are, are today not going to church because because of a lie they've made up. Because they don't think it's important. And, and, and it's so easy. That's what he did. He lied right to God's man, right to his face. His heart wasn't right in the sight of God. And instead of being honest up front, he come to him and he said, I did all that the Lord called me to do. I performed it just like he said. No, he didn't. He lied. So we see... In, in, he goes on, he says uh, in verse 15, And Saul said, They have brought them from the Malachites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. So now he's trying to make up why and justify his lie. He's trying to rationalize why it's okay that, that he did it this way instead of the way that God told him to do it. Because, you know, we kept the best for our people. You know, we did this this way because of the, He's rationalizing Adrian, Dr. Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite men of God, once said that a lie is like a clock. He said if, it, if, if you was to take, take a clock and you was to take it, if it was off by, by eight or ten hours, he said no one would believe it. But if it was off by five minutes, it'd cause you to lose your plane. Remember when, when, when Adam and Eve was in the garden and, and Eve was tempted of the devil? He didn't come to her and, and present a lie to her that was far from the truth. He brought the truth and just changed one word. That's what lies does to people. And you know what happens when, when our heart isn't right with God? It's so easy to find a place to where we're, we're just rationalizing the truth. We're trying to make up a truth that fits us. And we're not being right with God, not being honest with God. That's what this man did. And I want you to see that all he was doing was an outward religious performance. And God says, I don't look upon the out, outside of man. See, coming to church and all these things. Let, let's read this scripture and then we'll go on. Verse 22, Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, listen to this, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Question, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To hearken than the fat of rams. Uh, for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. You know what rebellion is? In, in the sight of God, it's, it's as witchcraft. There is one thing that God cannot deal with. It's a heart of rebellion and stubbornness. It's a heart that says, I, I, I've got it right, I'm performing, I'm doing it. But the only time that God can really deal with your heart is when you open your heart up to Him and say, look, I can't do it on my own. 
Without you, I'm nothing. I want to be honest. I want to be right with God, and I want to give my heart right, and want to make it right with God. That's the only way God can deal with you today, is to open your heart to Him. David said in Psalms, he said, search me. Try me. Look, look at my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. And this morning, it would do us all some good. Every one of us, if we just be honest with God, honest with ourselves, open ourselves up to God and say, God, I know you don't look at, see as man sees. I realize that you don't look at my performance as a Christian, but you're looking on my heart. You know what's the most important thing about all of this is your motive. God's looking at your motive. God's wondering not what you're doing for Him as Saul thought. It was, look what I did. God don't care about what you do. God cares about why you do what you do. God's looking at your motive. And in the end, the Bible says that we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. If you're saved today, one of these days you'll stand before Him. And he, you will give an account for what you did in your body, whether it be good, whether it be bad. And on that day, you know what God's going to judge? He's not going to judge you of your sin. All that was nailed to His cross. It was taken out of the way. Thank God forever. But on that day, he's going, to, he's going to judge your motive. He's going to judge not what you did, but He's going to judge why you did what you did. And, and what you did out of a pure motive, I believe with all my heart, on that day it will not be burned up, but it will stand. And you shall receive a reward for that. And I'm looking forward to the day of the Lord. But it's time this morning that we would quit playing games and get our hearts right with God. I, I want to close on this. I had a lot more, but I feel like it, it's time, time to close. In, in verse number 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and thy words, because I, listen to this, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. I just believe that probably what will cause you to not get your heart right with God nine times out of ten is because you're afraid of something. You're afraid of what you're looking at ahead financially. Maybe you're afraid, you know, with, with your work, everything going on, what life is going to be like, uh, uh, in, in your looking future. You're afraid of what people will say, what people will do. If you do that, it will hinder you from getting your heart right with God. The thing to do is not worry about your neighbor, not worry about the future. Realize that all of that's in God's hands, and just put your trust and your hope in Jesus. That's what David did. He defeated a giant. I believe today if we do that, we could defeat giants in our life. We could, we could do that. One of the greatest scriptures that I love the most is whenever Peter was in the boat and Jesus came walking to him on the water. And if you remember... Jesus calls out to Peter and says, Peter, come. Peter never could have walked on the water if he didn't have the Word of God. When the Word of God, when Jesus spoke, come out on this water and walk with me, come, inviting him to come out of that boat, inviting him to step out on that water, when he spoke that, that water became concrete. That water was like walking out on that sidewalk outside, and Peter just stepped out of that boat, started taking steps on the water. And that, that blows my mind. It amazes me to know that at the Word of God that somebody could do something so amazing if they would just put their heart in the right place and believe and trust in Him. And I thought about that man and he's, you know what, you know what happened? What caused him to stumble? What caused him to sink? He started to get afraid because he started to look around, started to see all the things out there that was uh, contrary with the winds blowing and the seas that were raging, everything going on. He got afraid and he started to sink. Why? Because he took his eyes off Jesus. He took his eyes off the only one that could help him. And Rick Warren, <laughs> Rick Warren, one of the greatest pastors, I, I love that man, wrote the, the, the um, 40 days of purpose, and a purpose-driven life, a purpose-driven church, a wonderful man of God, he said, he said, there, there's two things in life that will, will keep you from living your life for God, keep your heart from being right with God. One of it is envying what everyone else has. It's wanting what everyone else has. I, I, you never have enough. I always want, and then when you get that, guess what? You're going to want more. When you get that, you're going to want more and more, and, and that will keep you from getting your heart right. And the second thing is people-pleasing. 
always trying to please somebody else, always wanting everybody to be happy. Guess what? You'll never make everybody happy. Not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to. But you know what? Just because everybody don't like the way I preach, just because everybody don't like my style, well, God's called me to do something the way that I do it. I don't care what everybody else says about it. You know why? Because I care about what God says about it. They didn't call me into this thing. God did. I'm not living for an audience other than one. And that's what Rick said. He said, if you would learn to live your life for an audience of one, you could do what God's called you to do, and it would be easy. It would be fun. It would be enjoyable. You would, it would be exciting. And, and, and that is the secret, I believe, today to live in. Jesus said that the devil came to kill, and to dis- kill, steal, and to destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You want to live the most abundant, blessed life you'll ever live. Cast your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for the Word of God. We thank You, Lord, for Your Son Jesus that went to Calvary and paid our sin debt, Father, in full that we would have the right to the tree of life. We thank You, God, for Your precious Word that's concrete. If we put our faith in it, God, we can walk all over it knowing that it won't waver, falter, or fail. And Lord, we we pray, God, this morning for uh, my dad. I pray, God, you would strengthen him and get him back into good health, back into the pulpit. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for this church. Thank you for this ministry. Thank you for touching lives here, God, and changing people and the work that this church is doing, Father, for this world that's lost. And I just pray that they continue, have the right heart, Father, have the right motive, God, to serve you with everything they've got while they can. Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.